I wanted to be good. I wanted God to love me. I turn and everywhere I look, brilliant people, intelligent people are following these rules. Why can't I just fit in? Why can't I be okay with being silent and subservient? Everyone else is. What's wrong with me? I'm reading your book. I love oh, it. It's thank um, you. what a brilliant book. Can thank I quote um, an early thing, an early sentence back at you? Anything. I'm I literally it. an open book. I have uh, actually an open Great. book. So. <laughs> <laughs> so this is from Brazen and yes. it's very early on okay. and you write, I walked into a world where no one knew me. I had no past, no shared history. I was a zero. Now I pursue zeros of a very different kind for thousands of women. What a great early line that is. <laughs> and with that in mind, let's go back to the beginning. Tell me a little bit about your early days and how, how they were a little bit different from, from what most, I suppose, Westerners might, might have experienced. Early days, are we talking in my old community or when I came out into this world? I think old community. Old let's community. start there. Okay. So I think the easiest way to define the world I lived in is to watch Bridgerton or any of these, you know, movies or television shows about the 17 and 1800s. Subtract the ball gowns and the fabulous clothing and you have my life. I lived an 18th century existence, right? Women are there to be wives and mothers. Their intellect is considered inferior to a man's. They are supposed to be covered head to toe and modest, uh, you know, in the olden days, if a woman slept around or, you know, was caught, you know, having an, uh, you know, not being a virgin before she was married, that was it. She didn't get married. Her family was shamed. And that's my world. My world was a world where women and men had completely different roles and were treated very differently. In my world, when you wake up in the morning as a woman, you say a set of prayers, uh, First one's very beautiful. Thank you, God, for giving me life and waking me up on this lovely day. And then you say to God, thank you for not making me a slave. And thank you for making me as you've chosen. A man, when he wakes up in the morning, he says, thank you for giving me life and waking me up. And his third prayer is, thank you for not making me a woman. That's the world I lived in. I wasn't a man, but I wasn't a slave. I was somewhere in between, but I had no autonomy. I didn't get to choose who I dated, how I dated, who I loved, what I wore, what I chose to put on my body, where I chose to do with my body, what profession I would have. My entire life was curtailed and this, and it was, you know, a minuscule size because it is my responsibility to prevent men from sinning. You know what surprised me about your story? Because, I, you know, you have all these, or one has all these ideas of what um, either a Hasidic or a yeshiva or ultra-Orthodox community might be like. But then the history of your parents uh, seemed very different because your father uh, was a concert pianist and, and, a, and a communist in Russia. And your mum is like a genius uh, with PhDs in maths and philosophy. So how does it go from that... And I know because I've read the book, but how does it go from that to to what you experienced growing up? So it's something, it's a question I have, you know, struggled with my whole life uh, as I write in the book. You know, I, it's not a question I can ask my mother because, well, number one, she doesn't speak to me. And number two, she doesn't like talking about pre-religious life, right? Because that's something shameful that she tries to avoid at all costs. Our past was not something to ever be discussed in my family. So if you can imagine a PhD being something of shame. Wow. Yeah. The only explanation I can give for it is that both my parents and especially my mother were brought up on this concept that you need to live for something greater than yourself, that your own individual happiness is irrelevant to the greater good. That's communism, mm -hmm. That's right? Communism, communism is yes. your individual happiness is irrelevant. It's the greater good that matters. And the more that you have to subsume and control your innate nature, the more you uh, satisfy your purpose in life of suffering for the greater good. So my mother was educated on martyrdom. Uh, you know, when I first 
wanted a divorce from my first husband in my community, and I told my parents, I want out. My, and I just, my mother asked me why, and I said, because I'm not happy. And she said, well, who says you have to be happy? Where in the Torah does it say you need to be happy? Why do you think you deserve happiness? That's the idea. And so what did she choose? Think about communism. Communism is a religion. Communism tells you everything you have to do, what's right, what's wrong, right? And I, I write in my book about the fact that when I was a little bit older and I met this elderly Russian man in New York, and he was bemoaning how much he missed Mother Russia, when I asked him what he missed, he said, being told what to do. I hate having to make decisions, <laughs> right? And so she left a religion, communism, where there was no self-autonomy and your own self-interest didn't matter. And she chose a replacement that had the same set of rules. Fundamentalist Judaism is very similar to communism. The greater good, your own happiness doesn't matter. Everything is decided for you. No self-autonomy and martyrdom in the sake of the larger population. She chose a religion that mimicked communism almost down to its core details. That's fascinating to think about uh, the metaphor of, I guess, the communist Russia versus the individuality of, of America. And then they moved to America. Um, and then uh, it's, it's so complex, isn't it? Because I guess they also uh, suffered a, a great deal of anti-Semitism. Uh, That's right. I, I, there was this moment in Texas where you wanted to go to a particular school and you weren't able to because you were Jewish. So they must have felt even more like we need this sense of community right. and uh, being away from Russia. And, and then you moved to Monsi, is it? So yes. what's, what's Monsi like? Uh, again, literally the 1800s, right? Women and baby with babies and baby carriages, men who do the you know work. Look, I worked, I was a high school teacher. But my money was not my own to control. I had to ask permission to spend it. Because, again, just like in the 1800s, a woman, she got married, the property immediately transferred to her husband. I mean, this, it's, 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 honestly, it's very simple. I lived an 18th century existence. And was yours... Uh, and th this is something I, I and I, I won't go too far into it this time because I have done before and and I, it's obvious it's a very difficult one. I mean, you've been criticised a bit by the Orthodox community. I've been criticised by some of the Orthodox community or just some Jewish people who feel um, attacked. Was your experience more extreme, or do you think this is typical of of different ultra Orthodox sects? Well, I'm going to read you something, and then I think you can answer the question for yourself. <laughs> sure. um, so when I when the show came out, I got a lot of criticism from the Orthodox community, much less so when the book came out, because when the book came out, what I did because I got criticism on the show is an accompaniment to the book is brazenbook.com, the website. If you go on there, there's a link that takes you to hundreds of footnotes where I prove every word that I said in my book. So it's that's why there's almost zero criticism since the book came out. You don't really see any. The only articles that came out, all the criticism came from the show because in the show, the show wasn't about my past. The show was about my present and it was mere little snippets of my past. So for example, I got criticized for saying that I didn't watch movies when they're like, oh, but you did. And then I say, yes, at the very end I did. It took me eight years to plan my escape and in my mid thirties, once I decided I wanted to leave, that's when I started watching movies, you know, so forth and so on. So because the show was just little snippets and I couldn't prove any of the things I was saying because that's not what the show was about, I got criticized. When the book came out, because of that criticism, I said, you know what? I'm going to fact check and bring proof of every word I say about that community. And I did. It's hundreds of footnotes, hundreds of pages, reams and reams of proof for every law that I cite, for everything that I say happened to me, it's all there. And I'm just but, going to read one. Go on. Um, only because I think the biggest criticism I got was that the education I received was wonderful and commensurate with the 21st century. And I could have gone to college and plenty of women from my school go to college, which is complete nonsense. I mean, genuine, actual nonsense. 
I learned nothing in high school. My education is not, it was so subpar to the worst public school in this country. Um, for, bio, for biology, I learned Hilchus Lashon Hara, which is laws of proper speech. I mean, we had a class called biology. We had a class called chemistry. I never went into a single chem, we had an actual chemistry lab. We never walked into it. We never did anything there. I'd never one step. Is that for, for appearances, for in case it gets inspected? Appearances, because not just appearances, but for government funding, right? To get government funding, you need to have chemistry. You need to have biology. So they have a chemistry lab that I've never once used. I never touched a beaker. I never used a droplet. I know nothing about chemistry. I was taught zero. There's a story in your book, isn't there, of, of one of your classmates who, who wanted to go to college and asked for her records and they wouldn't give them to her and locked the schools so That's she couldn't like, go in and get them. That's correct. My daughter couldn't get her transcript. I had to go through crazy machinations just to <sighs> force the school to give my daughter her trans transcript. And the school that finally complied was not the school she went to. We had to do <sighs> this whole craziness where she I had to... She had to retake certain tests in, in, a, in a more modern Orthodox high school so that she could graduate high school and they would send her the transcripts. I mean, what I had to go through to just get her marks, her grades that she earned was madness. So all of that, I was called a liar and how wonderful. And then they found like there's this one doctor and one lawyer. Congratulations. Yes, there are two people in my community with degrees. That doesn't mean the schools educate you. So someone sent me a letter from Beis Yaakov, right? It's a system of schools. I went to a Beis Yaakov. There's Beis Yaakov's in Muncie and Brooklyn and every community, religious community has this Beis Yaakov. And I want to read you the letter because here's what it says. Dear parents, in the last years, it's becoming increasingly prevalent for high school girls to be preparing themselves and working towards a college degree while in high school. Now, this is from... <sighs> 2020. Okay, so in the last few years, so clearly not when I was in high school, right? right? In the last few years, all of a sudden, there's this terrifying trend that women are trying to go to college. Now, wait, now you're going to see what kind of college they're talking about. They're not talking about Princeton or Harvard. They're talking about online schools or religious colleges where you still learn the same subjects with the same people. Okay, listen to this. This is not the reason Klal Yisrael, Klal Yisrael is the, um, the Jewish people, have established Beis Yaakov schools for Benos Yisrael, for girls. And it is not in line with a Beis Yaakov Chinuch. It is not in line with a Beis Yaakov education. College is not in line with our education. Black and white, you can see it on the brazenbook.com website. It's there. This is not my word. It is the school itself saying, we do not prepare girls to go to college. And it continues. This is not the reason it's established school. A Torah chinuch, a Torah education, does not mean the subjects they are learning. It means that they are connecting and drawing life from one source only, which is Torah. Can't go to college. College is not Torah. Okay. Beis Yaakov schooling was established to give our Benos Yisrael, our young women, a direct connection to Torah. It was to become the sole source of their learning and connection to life. To have them then connected to college in any form, which is an independent source, or should we say an outside source, during those years that were set aside for them to draw life from Torah learning only, is not to their benefit, is detrimental and antithetical to base yak of schooling. Now, does that sound like a school that you can go to college from? No, it sounds completely crazy. It sounds completely crazy. The fact that college courses, and now we're going to define what kind of college they're talking about. They're not talking about girls going to Stanford University. No one from base Yaakov is going to Stanford, right? Here's the colleges that they describe. The fact that the college courses may be Chumash, Halacha, etc. These are Jewish courses, Bible study, Torah law, or subjects they have already learned, meaning these are not real colleges. These are these, I don't want to say uh, BS colleges. These are tangential colleges where religious studies are given credit, accreditation. Okay? Yeah. Does not change the fact that they are in college. For all purposes, once your daughter has connected herself to college, she has disconnected herself from Torah learning. 
to that and only that which is her only source in life. If your daughter is presently preparing for or taking any college courses or tests for college, please make an appointment to discuss with us. And then on the bottom, you have to fill out, if you can see, these two little checks. And the two little checks, one check says, my daughter is not taking any college courses or preparatory tests. The second check says, my daughter is taking college courses or preparatory tests. I would like to set up an appointment. So it's you're going to tell me that I exaggerated? No, I told the truth. People don't like the truth. You know why? Because it points fingers and says, hey, something is wrong. Well, that's what I have to remind myself as well, because I don't like being criticized. Um, it doesn't feel good. And I have this nature sometimes, maybe naivety, where I go, oh, God, maybe I got this wrong. And then I have to remind myself, well, these are people from within what I would consider a, a very insular uh, community or very defensive people, at least. But I guess another point that they're, some of them are making, and perhaps wrongly, that it's not that you exaggerate. They're saying, but, but yours was a very extreme college, for example. So give me an idea is it is it is this widespread across uh let's say the american and british um ultra orthodox communities this is the main source of schooling for women in any black hat ultra orthodox community it's base yakov there are base yakov schools in london in manchester in golders green they're all over the world it is the central core message and system of the ultra-Orthodox schooling education for women that their only purpose in life is to be wives and mothers, and the only education they receive is, should be from their Jewish high school, period. That's a fact. It is a fact. My story is not unique or extraordinary in any way, shape, or form. And to say that it's something that I experienced but other women don't is just factually inaccurate. Now, what you can say is other women experience it and they don't mind. They're happy being wives and mothers. And here's what I always say to that. This isn't a happiness contest. This is an equality issue. Happy or not, the question is, is it equitable or is it not? Are the laws fair or are they not? And I always say this to people. When suffragette movement came through, in the UK, in the US, was it only men attacking the suffragettes? No. No. No, plenty of women. It was millions of women, millions. And what did they say? We're happy. We love being wives and mothers. We don't need the right to vote. And yet their daughters are very grateful that the women who marched did. And that's what I say. The women of my generation may say to themselves, I'm used to not having these rights. I'm okay, I'm happy, but I'm going to fight for their daughters and their daughter's daughters, whether they like it or not. Julia, I love how you talk. You, you, this, where does this eloquence come from? I suppose uh, you, genius parents to an extent. Is that, <laughs> is that where it comes from? Well, you know, I, uh, I had to educate myself, right? I received really no education. I received a 17th century education. And so the only way to... It's a very, as you saw in the book, it's not like I decided one morning I'm out and I just walk out the door. It took me years, eight years of educating myself, of trying to familiarize myself with a world that was 300 years out of anything I understood. I am a true tra time traveler. I, I knew nothing about the outside world. And by the way, that's why most people who leave my community do end up committing suicide do have substance abuse issues because we are not equipped to handle the 21st century. We were not taught to handle the 21st century. You cannot imagine how disconcerting and disorienting and confusing it is to walk into a world you don't recognize. In my world, women aren't allowed to live alone. You go from your father's house to your husband's house. To come into a world where with women had any autonomy was really shocking to me. The first time I slept in a room by myself, I was 42 years old. It's hard for people to conceive of such a thing. And so it's either just to call me a liar or an exaggerator than to realize that it's true and it's happening in our century. Well, the rest of us don't think you're a liar. I just Thank want to you. clarify no, that. It's just, a, it's just those people. I appreciate so that. No, it's just hurtful because it's like, 
It's yeah. it's the trauma of having to have lived through it and then having someone try to negate your experience and say, no, that never happened, which is just ludicrous. And um, I think, you know, the way that I survived that transition is through reading. Words are my lifeline. So to, I think to answer your question in terms of my speaking and why I, I write books, well, a book, uh, and I have the show and I do everything that I do, it's because knowledge is power. Knowledge is the key to everything. And education, to me, if these women in my world are educated, the day that they realize that they deserve more is the day that we change the world together. That's beautifully put, Julia. And you know what? I'm writing a book about uh, the psychology of secrets and, and how secrets are used against people. And there is a section I'm doing about religion and cults and things. And I'm going to quote you in there, uh, if you don't mind. Absolutely. But, uh, I'm happy to. It, 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 there's I, there's a there's a real um, there's a real similarity between you know the creation story Adam and Eve and the tree of knowledge and they have to be careful not to get any knowledge that's the worst right. thing you can have and then that's there was it. this scene in your in your book about a classmate uh, whose family had a television can you and then the teacher was sort of smelling it can you tell <laughs> oh, us about this that is amazing so okay TVs so you have to understand I, yeah, fundamentalism can only exist in isolation right so the outside world has to be the enemy and dangerous. You can't have a television. The television is too connective to the outside world. I'm sitting in class one day, and my principal comes in, and she is, and everyone was frightened of her. She's a very brilliant, very, very charismatic and powerful woman. She comes in, and she says, I smell Tuma. And we're like, oh, my God. Tuma means um, impurity, uh, like oh. rot. And we're all looking around like, oh my gosh, I smell Tuma! And we're just <laughs> shaking in our seats. And she points to a girl in my class and she says, you have brought Tuma into this class. You have brought Tuma into this school. You have brought Tuma into your classmates. And this poor girl is sitting there now and she's white as a ghost and sh shaking hysterically. Why? How did she bring impurity into the classroom? There is a television in your home. You must go home tonight. You must take an ax and you must chop, chop, chop the television. God. That's what oh we were talking about. Because it almost sounds funny to hear you do it as like the <laughs> impersonation years later. But, but it was how very terrifying. frightening. It was not funny. <gasps> we were terrified. Terrified. <sighs> People didn't Does talk to her. Does everyone have an axe at home? Is that a normal thing to keep at home? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> that was literally what she said. Verbatim. Oh, it's the TV of knowledge, isn't it? It's the tree of go. knowledge. It's the, it's the same thing. It's the same thing. Education is dangerous. When I started dating, I was warned, Julia, you're, you know, to, because not only was I not allowed to read secular things, right? I wasn't allowed to read most of the religious, uh, you know, books, farim that are in my community. And I was constantly being told, Julia, you shouldn't have read this. You shouldn't have known that. You shouldn't have looked into that. Don't tell your husband or the person you're about to go out with that you know these things. You're never going to get married. <laughs> Just ignorance is celebrated. Ignorance is celebrated. When I taught in high school, my first high school, and one of the teachers saw my lesson plan, she said, oh, are you having problems at home? And I said, uh, sorry, what do you mean? She's like, well, this is way too erudite. You're going to make your husband feel insecure. It's, That's it, the world every, I lived in. Every like cult and extreme religion seems to turn into like a boys' club it eventually, it's where, a boys where club. these these guys all just sort of make it so it's as comfortable as possible for them, yeah. and so you can suppress the women. I mean, it, it is sad. And you know what's maybe surprising for people who have not experienced something like that, but you know, reading your book, it makes sense of course is that it seems like a lot of this stuff you you didn't just um you know go along with when you were young you you enjoyed and got uh, the pleasure from you know the modesty and that kind of thing i wanted to be good i wanted god to love me i i wanted to please everyone around me and even more than that i i turn and everywhere i look 
brilliant people, intelligent people are following these rules. So I kept thinking to myself, what's wrong with me? Why can't I just fit in? Why can't I be okay with being silent and subservient? Everyone else is. It's what God wants from me. What's wrong with me? That it was, I always assumed that something was inherently wrong with me that I couldn't be okay with these. And I do want to point out one thing because I am saying a lot of negative things and I, I want to stop for a second and say a few positive things as well. So I've had two things happen recently that have given me tremendous hope. What I always say to people is, look, I love being Jewish. I'm proud to be a Jew. And I don't think there are any, there's no malicious intent. I think, I always say everyone in my story is a victim because they're taught these things. They think it's right as well. Until we change the laws, they're as much a prisoner as I am. I, I, yeah, I guess it's a good point to remind uh, listeners who have no experience of Judaism and Jewish people and stuff that firstly, this is a very small percentage of Minuscule. Jews in general. Tiny, yeah, tiny, tiny, tiny percentage. It's the most uh, yeah. extremist version of religious Jews. And most religious Jews are, live very modern lives. They're modern Orthodox. They go to college. They have televisions. They live a perfectly normal existence and I have tremendous respect for them and all the things that I'm saying absolutely do not apply in those communities. That's number one. Number two, in my community, I love the people in my community. I just want them to have it all. I want them to be able to be religious and not be downtrodden and 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 minimized and, and enslaved because they're women. I don't want to attack. I want to make their lives better. And I think that it may be starting, and I'm going to tell you something that happened to me recently that I almost fainted. I was so shocked. So I'm in, I don't want to name the place because it might give away who this person is. I was in a location. So this very famous rabbi that every single person in the Hasidic or black hat world knows, even if you're living in Austria, if you're a black hatter, you know who this guy is. It's a small world, right? We're all interconnected. One of the most famous people in my world. And he starts walking toward me. And, okay, rabbis like that, rabbis that are that big, they travel with an entourage, right? So he's got his shamish and his people who are always around him. And, and I see them heading towards me. I'm like, oh, no, here I was going to go. I'm going to get yelled at that I'm a this and a that. And why can't I keep my mouth shut? And... Blah, 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 blah. I'm like, oh my God. And I'm literally stealing myself for an attack. And he comes over with his whole posse and he looks down on me because I'm tiny. And he says, Ms. Hart, my wife and my daughters, thank you. No. Yeah. And walked away. <laughs> you understand? I, it took me probably 40 seconds to recover. I, every time I think about it, I burst out crying because this is a man who could actually affect change. This is someone who can actually do something about it. And if he's coming to me and saying, my wife and daughters, thank you, that means my message is getting across because I love Judaism. I love the people in my community. I want them to have it all. And if I have awoken some people to say, wait a minute, Maybe we aren't treating women properly. Maybe these are laws that need to change. Maybe women will be happier to be religious if we don't push them down every day. Yeah. So but, but maybe I guess my concern my concern with that is isn't in some sense it seems incompatible because you talk of the prayers right from the moment you wake up the prayers already make a, an inequality between the the sexes. But, but there's a lot of things that have that have been changed in the last couple hundred years. For example, there used to be a law, I know it's gonna sound crazy, but it, it's not in today's day and age. There used to be a law that if a woman was raped, her rapist would be forced to marry her. Uh. Can you imagine? Now what woman in her right mind would want to marry her rapist, okay? But go back three, 4,000 years and think about what a woman with a child alone unmarried would be forced to do. Yeah. Awful. And it's right. So my point is there are laws that existed back then that they have repealed now. Obviously in today's day and age, 
there is no law in even the most extreme ultra-Orthodox community that a woman should marry her rapist. That law has been negated, right? So there are many laws that got thrown out because they don't apply to today's time. It's not, I'm not asking for something that has not happened before. There's multiple laws that have changed. For example, um, pre-Babylonian times, men could marry, marry 10 women. You could have as many wives as you want. Nowadays, that's not the case. So there are many laws that have changed as times have progressed. I'm just asking for these laws to go, for those prayers to be gone. Prayer, by the way, prayer has been changed so many times I can't begin to tell you, right? It was first said orally, and then it was put in writing, and then it was put in writing twice. And then when people were illiterate, the chazan had to read it, and people just say amen because half of the religious you know, world in Eastern Europe couldn't read, so they couldn't read the prayers. So things have changed, and you know, it, it has elasticity, right? It has some elasticity there. So I'm just asking for that elasticity to being used to win it. You know what I wanted to ask you? So uh, in your the community you grew up in, what would they think of a, a Jewish man, secular atheist man like myself? <laughs> Lost soul, darling. They, they you know, t look, again, going back to the 18th century example, in go to like Regency England or, or, or pre-revolution France, right? Lineage is all that mattered. And your lineage is if when your family came to the Golden Medina to the United States, they kept their religion, there they have lineage, they have royalty in their blood, right? In my community, royalty is how many rabbis you've got in your, in your family tree, okay? Um, if your family came, like your family, when they, where is your family from originally? Uh, Ukraine, Russia, those okay. kinds of places. So when they came to the UK, they left religion. They became irreligious at some point, correct? Yeah. So people like you and me, whose families, whose ancestors left religion, we're like lesser beings. Oh. Okay. Even worse than non-Jewish people or about the same? Uh, different because non-Jewish people are just, you know, or non-Jews, we don't, we don't, we don't bother with those guys. Jewish people, you're considered a tinok shenishba, which means a captive child, meaning you're a sinner against, but you're a sinner against your own will because you just weren't educated properly. So it's not really your fault. So you know you're kind of like this nebulous, sad Jew kind of thing because you are a sinner. You eat non-kosher, you're polluting your body, you're angering God, but it's not your fault. You were kind of capped. You're like a captive child. You know, you, you didn't know any better. So it's like a child raised in captivity who was not taught about Torah. Therefore, it's not really his fault. So they, you're, you're something to pity. You're someone to pity. That's basically the concept. And um, you know how like in the olden days, women, heiresses from the United States would marry British aristocracy to get. So my can you do the same thing. If you're like me or you, or you grew up irreligious, and so you don't have that nobility of, and royalty of all these rabbis in your background, you need to have a lot of money to clean the shame of that and to marry into a royal rabbinic family. That's how it works. So for example, my brother, my brothers and my younger sister all married rabbinic royalty because by the time my siblings were getting married, my parents had so much money that they were able to buy into rabbinic families. It, it wow. works exactly like it did in the 1800s. Okay, so then, and when you left, right, that must have caused a bit of a scene. You say you don't get on with your parents now. So, I mean, how was that? Like, let, I mean, this must have been mad for everyone insane. around you. Well, first of all, nobody saw it coming. Nobody. I didn't tell a single human being. I never spoke my doubts. I never voiced my misery. I was too afraid because, well, first of all, people already thought I was crazy. I was already a rebel because again, you know, it was a slow, gradual transformation. So before I left, I was already watching movies openly and going to movie theaters and there was no more stockings. And so I was already really, really skating on thin ice. Um, so if I would have told people I'm out or I'm planning to leave, oh, that would, I mean, who knows what have happened? They would have taken away my kids. I, I don't know what have happened. So 
I told no one. So when I walked out the door, I everyone was flummoxed completely. They thought I'd lost my mind. Here was this woman. She was a high school teacher for 20 years. You know, she taught all this Chumash, Torah, Navi, Halakha, Chamesh, Megillah, Parsha, all this stuff. And all of a sudden she turns around. She's like, bye. I mean, no one, into everyone, it seemed, in the, you know, uh, what's what's his name? Um, who's that brilliant uh, investor dude? Um, oh, who, uh, who says Elon like, Musk? No, no, no. Um, who said that, you know, everyone always says I became a billionaire overnight. They just don't realize overnight took 40 years. Um, <laughs> they, they didn't realize yeah. that I'd been planning this for nine years. I'd been educating myself for nine years. I'd been, wow. I mean, this was a very long, long process to them. It was one minute she's religious, the next minute she's not. And no one understood what was going on. Um, and at first people just thought I'd literally had like a mental breakdown and they're like, she just lost her mind. And then people realize, oh, no, she hasn't lost her mind. She's out. And how, how was your mother? Well, my parents haven't spoken to me since the day I locked out the door. Not one word. But the whole thing's a bit weird. And I've always said this. And I get again, I, it's another thing I get shouted at for. And it's that I've said that although <laughs> I shouldn't repeat it because I'll get shouted at more. But uh, I've said that, you know, there's this idea of maternal and paternal love um, for the children. And I do believe in it, but it's amazing when you talk to people from extreme religions and cults and things, uh, how easily it seems to be broken. And for example, your birthdays, you would just be like, you know, it's my birthday today. And they just didn't even remember. And they left you at home when they went on holidays to look after like all the other children. It was like this sort of Cinderella kind of thing. Um, I did not have a fun childhood, but again... Who says you have to have a fun childhood? Who says you have to well, be happy, right? Well, yeah. That's, that's, that's their basic, that was their philosophy. Their philosophy is you are put on this earth to serve. Wow. Period. So if you're put on this earth to serve, go serve. But do you feel like they loved you? It's a tough question. You know, um, my mother, my my. Yeah, you know, there's me and then there's 10 years gap and then there's seven other children, right? So I was basically their mommy. My sister, Hannah, who's closest in age to me is 10 years younger than I. And she was the originally the only person in my family who spoke to me when I left. But now she doesn't speak to me either because her community gave her an ultimatum. It's us or your sister. And she chose her community. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah, I mean, again, it's hurtful, but I understand it, you know. Um so we did this thing for a year uh, when she was living in Miami and I was living in um, Atlanta. We did this thing where every time we spoke to my mother, so this is when I'm still in the community, right? But my mother already didn't approve of me because I was too modern Orthodox. I was, as you, you know, as you saw, I started reading secular literature. I started arguing with people. My skirts came a little bit higher. My stockings came a little bit lower, you know. So as I became progressively more modern, my mother became very, you know, disappointed in me. And um, for one full year, we would end every conversation with my mother with an I love you to see if she would ever say it back. And in a year of ending every conversation with her with I love you, she never said it back, not once. So do I think she loves me? I think she loves me as much as she's capable of loving a person. I think she loves ideals and religion more. Does, it, does that? How does that make you feel now? Have you sort of just gone, ah, forget it, that's a different thing, or do you, do, do you dwell on it? No, I... I mean, does it hurt? Of course it hurts. I miss my family. I miss my siblings. I raised them. I changed their diapers. I did their homework. I put them to sleep. I They literally called me mommy. These are people I raised. And now they don't speak to me because I'm this terrible sinner. Um, so of course it hurts. I miss them. But I have zero anger. Literally none. Because it's not their fault. They're victims too. They're indoctrinated and brainwashed. They think they're doing the right thing. They truly believe that to associate with me would be damaging for their souls. They're doing Which what is, they're taught is right. How can I fault them for that? I can't. And I gather that was partly why, I mean, there, there's a part in the book, you have these struggles with, with leaving and perhaps contemplating even taking your life and wondering what that would do to the people you left behind. I mean... 
it seemed easier to kill myself than to walk into the 21st century. It's it's so hard to explain to people. It It's like saying to you, you have to go to Mars now. Go to Mars. Go figure it out. It's really terrifying. And it's even more terrifying at 42 to go to Mars and learn a new language and a new culture and people that are so foreign to you that they really feel like another group of humanity. I mean, I didn't I didn't know anyone outside of my community. You know, I was afraid of non-Jews if you could imagine such a thing. I was really afraid you, of them. But it's it's so mad though to think of you back then and then you didn't just like assimilate. You sort of dominated that whole world you become like the ceo of a huge fashion industry you've got like this kardashians uh tv <laughs> series like you absolutely smashed it like well, how go does that or go home baby <laughs> <laughs> i mean <laughs> i mean i figured look if i can time travel i can do anything yeah Nothing matters anymore. It's Nothing like a different, matters anymore. like you say, you're on Mars now. You might as well just play the game. <laughs> That's it. If I'm, you know, and also I think, you know, bef- you know, before my marriage went south, my husband used to say, you were in a pressure cooker. And when that lid came off, you just exploded because that's what it was. For so many years, everything I had inside of me, all my skills and capabilities and talents and everything I thought and wanted to achieve, I was told that all of that was evil and wrong to even think about. So the minute I was given the autonomy to work, I couldn't stop. You know, when people ask me what is my favorite thing to do in my new world, it's work. It's not party or go to clubs or date or anything. It's working, it's achieving, it's changing things, it's creating, it's inventing. This is what gives me life. And I can't stop. It's, I need it. it. It gives me so much joy. What were some of the bits that when you first came out were the most sort of alien? And I, 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 use, I always use this example. There was a woman called Emily Green uh, who, who got out of the Hasidic community in, in London. And she said she went to a job interview uh, for quite a highbrow job, I think it was. And she was wearing jeans. And that's why she didn't get the job. And she didn't understand that <laughs> jeans were different to suit trousers and stuff like that, which I, I always use that example because it blows my mind. Like, of course, what that makes How sense now. Know? but <laughs> Yeah. What were some of the things like like that for you? Oh, gosh. I mean, literally everything. I think, you know, in my, I didn't know about, I'd never heard of a contract. Like in my world, you just shake hands because your next door neighbor's related to their cousin's uncle's brother. <laughs> and if they mess with you, then you're in synagogue to get, you know what I mean? It's all, <laughs> it's all done very, it's, there's no contract. There's very little in, in many of these kind of deal structures. It's all a handshake. Like my first partners, we wrote our thing on a napkin. I just assumed when I paid someone something, that was it. They knew they would get paid. I didn't realize you have to have a sign off and that the contract, has, the invoice has to be stamped and paid and sent back so that you have proof that you paid it. And so people would say, oh, no, you didn't pay it. And I'd be like, yes, I did. And they're like, show me proof. And I'd be like, uh. So people took tremendous advantage of my lack of understanding of these kind of things, and it's still kind of biting me in the ass now. I still realize that I, you know, my my current husband made you know fooled me a lot when it comes to contracts because it's not something I was very cognizant of or familiar with. Um, and then in the personal space, everything. Like my first boyfriend, I've had one boyfriend. Right, I'm 51 years old. I've had one boyfriend because left my marriage. You know, there's no boyfriends before I got married, and then. I just wanted to experience, I had a, like a sexual revolution of my own, right? And sure. then I had a boyfriend and then I met my husband. So I've had literally one boyfriend. And um, I remember when we first became like official girlfriend, but I didn't know what that meant. I literally sat him down and said, okay, are there rules? Like, are we supposed to talk every day now? Am I supposed to text you? Good? Like, I didn't know what to do. Like, what is a girlfriend supposed to do? What's normal? What's not normal? What should I expect? What should I not expect? What should he expect? Like, I was literally telling you, tell me what a girlfriend does. I had no clue. 
You know what, though, in in most respects, you're right in that that, that you are in a disadvantage at a disadvantage in in those things. But there's also a slight advantage because the rest of us also don't really know what anything <laughs> means and what we're doing. And oh, are we exclusive? Are we together? Do I don't know about contracts yes. and invoices and things? But I can't ask because I'm a 33, <laughs> nearly 34 year old man who should already know what I'm doing. Um, so I can't really ask. Whereas you can now because you know you can sit down and say, hey, you know. Explain this to me yeah. exactly how it is, and then you can learn. <laughs> That's true. That's true. I am. I'm a. I'm an eternal student. You know, and it just you don't even realize like so many of these little things, and also just pop culture knowledge. As much as I started watching TV when I planned my escape, I watched for a few years. Right. Um, I was inviting to this event by Caring. You know, who owns like Gucci and uh, oh, Caring Group. So there's like LVMH, and then there's Caring. And they invited me to this screening of Thelma and Louise with Thelma and Louise, with Susan Sarandon and uh, Gina Davis. And cool. you know they were going to speak about it, and it was the anniversary of when it came out and blah, blah, blah. And we're in this theater in Manhattan, this small theater, and the movie's playing, and people are talking. People are whispering. And I'm sitting going, shh, shh. And the person sitting next to me is like, my God, you would think you'd never seen this movie. And I'm like, I've never seen this movie. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to say that you shushed Susan Sarandon not knowing who she was. <laughs> I have done things like that. I'll tell you, I'm a, a massively embarrassed. Well, no, I, sh I probably should not say Go this on. on Please uh, do. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just, you know, because again, I, there are just so many holes in my understanding of pop culture knowledge, what's appropriate, what's inappropriate. I just don't know. And I learn as I go. And I make a lot of really embarrassingly silly mistakes. Um, yeah, that are pretty pretty bad. I feel like you were going to tell me one. I was. You, I was going to tell you one, but then I realized I'm just saying it publicly, <laughs> and it's so embarrassing. It makes I'll me come sound up. So I, you, you really don't want to tell us <laughs> me. <laughs> I'll, I'll. You know what? I'll. I'll. I'll uh, kind of synopsize it a little bit so I don't sound overly stupid. So, um, I was. <laughs> Gosh, um, let's just say that people that I should have recognized and known uh, in the UK and how to appropriately uh, speak to them and, you know, what the, the proper words to call them by, I really stuck both feet in my mouth and then swallowed them whole because I had no idea how to deal with any kind of royalty or non-royalty relationship kind of things. So I just, I made an, a complete and absolute fool of myself. And I luckily was able to say, not only am I an American, so please forgive me, I'm also come from a really, you know, isolated <laughs> community, so I'm just doubly stupid. <laughs> what did you do to the Queen, Julia? No, no, I didn't do anything to the Queen. Okay, gosh, um. I can't believe I'm telling you this story out loud. Well, here we go. Um, I, I uh, am involved in the elephant family, uh, you know, uh, travels to my elephant, I help, um, I'm... I'm really, in a, I love this uh, charity. It's called Elephant Family. It helps save the Asian elephant. Um, and there are, uh, there are uh, members, you know, uh, King Charles and Camilla, Queen Camilla, uh, and many members of the family are very involved in this because um, they've really taken on this as one of their charities. And I raised some money and they, they threw this cocktail event uh, that I was, you know, that I came to and um, they did this beautiful video for me and made this entire presentation. And, you know, I didn't know, you know, usually when, when you're invited to a cocktail party and you're told a cocktail party starts at seven, what would you think? When do you yeah, go you to come at like 7.30. 7.30. Okay, you don't do that if the people inviting you are part of the royal family. Oh, I didn't know. Yeah, neither did I. And I made a complete <laughs> ass of myself because I come 45 minutes late and I wanted to sink through the floor. I felt so embarrassed. And they were so lovely and so kind and so, I mean, <laughs> just so generous to me. And, you know, they made me feel not as stupid as I felt. Um, you know, they were, I, I, they couldn't have been nicer. Um, and, uh, they, they smiled at my ignorance and were just so 
elegant about it. And they're like, Julia, no, don't worry. We understand. I'm like, I'm so sorry. I'm an American. I don't know anything. <laughs> and I just felt so badly because they were so generous with their time. And I, I felt really stupid. So, yeah, I get into situations like this all the time. Well, most of us don't know what to do around. I would never. I wouldn't know what to do around them. I didn't so know. Like, and I'm I felt English. So bad. Had I known that, and that they had, and they had made a whole video for me, and were giving me a presentation award, and I missed my own video, my own presentation. I could. So oh, no. embarrassing. Like so <laughs> dumb. Anyway. It's a cool story to have yeah, though, well. now, isn't it? That's a good way to look at <laughs> it. Um, we've, got, we've got a couple minutes left. Just tell me a little bit about, I mean, how's Batsheva? And, and just to make it clear, it wasn't Prince Charles and Camilla that were giving me the award. It was oh, okay. a different member of the royal family that was okay. going to present it. And, and I just, I don't want to embarrass this particular, I mean, not that it's embarrassing, to the contrary, she was lovelier than any human being deserved after I messed it up. <laughs> I just, I'm trying to leave names out because I don't want to get into any situations, but... Um, they, the entire, I mean, the people that I've met have been beyond lovely to me and I'm so grateful to oh. all of them. They've been so kind to me and I'm really oh, I'm so, of I'm pleased to hear that. We've got yeah. a couple, just in the last couple of minutes, I just want to hear about, uh, you know, is there any more, um, my unorthodox life coming up? Um, and, and how's, you know, how are the kids? How's Batsheva? She's got a, a social media influencer career. looks kids great. Her Instagram great. Page. Kids are great. You know, I can't talk about Netflix until Netflix talks about Netflix. Um, but uh, kids are doing really well. Miriam's back in Stanford, even though she graduated already. Um, she's taking some other classes there. Uh, Bacheva is killing it in, uh, you know, her career. Shlomo is working with me on Plus Body, my shapewear company that we're about to relaunch. Um, we had to put a pause on it because of my whole divorce thing, but now we're coming back strong. I'm really, really excited about it. Uh, so he works with me every day. And um, yeah, I love my kids. I'm really lucky. Oh, they're fantastic. And your the show is fantastic. The book is fantastic. Please, everyone go out and get Brazen. Brazen is out in the UK. Is it? Did it get released later in the UK? I think it got released the same day. Oh, I think it? now okay. it's the paperback book copy, cover. That paperback is coming to UK before it comes to US. Oh, that's what it is. Yeah. Okay. Well, I just, it's the most phenomenal book. Thank it's you. really insightful and unique. And, and I encourage everyone to go out and buy a copy and to watch My Unorthodox Life on Netflix because that's just fascinating to watch and fun as well. Uh, Julia, thank you for being on The Edge. Thank you so much. It was really a pleasure. I really enjoyed it. Thank you, Andrew. Join me on The Edge for new episodes every week. Start watching right now.